Welcome to another edition of News of the Day, where we talk about uh, the latest scientific research papers that have significance for science faith issues. And this is a paper that got published just a few days ago in the journal Particles, as written by Lior Shamir. He's at Kansas State University. He's a computer scientist. And this is one of a couple of papers that have been an attempting to revive Fritz Zwicky's tired light hypothesis that he came up with way back in the 1930s. And I knew Fritz Zwicky when I was at Caltech, and he's famous for being way ahead of his time. But back in the early 1930s, he was suggesting that maybe the red shifts that we see of galaxies are not due to the expansion of the universe, but rather due to the fact that light, as it travels through space, uh, loses energy. This is called the tired light hypothesis. And astronomers, for the last several decades, based on their measurements, have been uh, quite skeptical of the tired light hypothesis. But recently, based on James Webb Space Telescope images, that seem to suggest that galaxies in the early universe look a lot more mature, that is older, than what Big Bang models would predict. Uh, this tired light hypothesis has been revived. And this is the latest and the most significant attempt uh, to do that. And uh, what Lior uh, Shemir did as a computer scientist was a statistical analysis. He basically noticed that uh, galaxies uh, rotate in the same direction as their Milky Way galaxy, and some rotate in the opposite direction. So he did a statistical analysis of databases of rotations of galaxies and redshift measurements of galaxies, and he, te he detected a small apparent bias, namely that the galaxies that rotate in the same direction as our Milky Way galaxy tend to show a slightly higher redshift than the average of galaxies that are rotating in the opposite direction. And what particularly caught his attention is that when you look at the very distant galaxies, I mean, you really don't see an effect in nearby galaxies, but the most distant galaxies, he was noticing that the greater the distance, uh, the greater the discrepancy uh, between redshift measurements of galaxies that rotate in the same direction as supposed galaxies that rotate in the opposite direction. He also noticed there were more galaxies in the distant universe that tended to rotate in the opposite direction. And so his analysis is basically saying this could be a suggestion uh, that light indeed does tire, loses energy, as it travels from very great distances uh, as towards our telescope. Now, to be sure, he's not claiming that this effect shows up in the nearby universe, but in the very uh, distant uh, universe. And therefore, he ends this paper by saying, maybe there's something significant about these early galaxies in the universe being imaged by the James Webb Telescope looking older than they should, and perhaps the standard Big Bang creation model uh, needs to be very substantially revised. Now, I read the paper, and the first thing that struck my attention was, this is like deja vu for me. I remember when I was a graduate student at the University of Toronto, we had a visiting professor uh, come and give a lecture. And it was basically saying, if we look at, uh, in our galaxy, if we look at uh, the maps of stars, we seem to see a statistically significant number of stars that seem to be oriented along the rim of a perfect circle. And so he came up with the hypothesis that there must be a supernova eruption at the center of that galaxy, blowing out gas and dust, and, th and that would cause stars to form uh, along a perfect circle around uh, that uh, supernova eruption. And uh, his uh, hypothesis stood for about 20 years. And, uh, you know, because, and he was basically saying, demonstrating, it really does seem to be statistically significant that we see stars oriented with respect to one another uh, along uh, the, a perfect circle. But what happened was, as the database of stars got larger and larger, astronomers were able to demonstrate it was simply a statistical artifact. And uh, I noticed that Shamir is open to that possibility, 
uh, but he is claiming that he thinks he's got a statistically significant effect here. Uh, but my opinion is we need to wait and see. Just like what happened 50 years ago, we need to get a bigger database of a distant redshift, redshift, measurement, redshift measurements of distant galaxies, these rotation measurements, and see if we really are seeing something that's statistically significant, or is this simply an artifact that's typical with large databases. I'll give you an analogy uh, that's quite well known within the Christian community, and it's called the Bible code hypothesis, the idea that if you look at the words in the Bible in the original Hebrew language, we seem to see a repetition form. Uh, and Muslims have done this with the Quran, where they say every 19th letter, if you look at every 19th letter, uh, you get a message, and they claim it's statistically significant. Uh, people have done that with the Bible, and you know, counting every 23rd number, or every 11th number, and they're getting these statistically significant messages. What they're overlooking is a systematic effect, namely that you could use a step pattern of every 19th letter, every 36th letter, every 5th letter, every 11th letter, every 100th letter. If you look at all the step possibilities, it's simply inevitable that one of them will reveal to you what appears to be statistically a significant message. And that's what uh, caused the theory of these perfect circles of stars to disappear. They realized, hey, if you've got a large enough uh, statistical base and you're willing to look at a variety of geometric images, not just circles, but rectangles, uh, you know, equilateral triangles, you're bound to get one of them that will show what appears to be a statistically significant effect. Likewise, in this case, it could be simply statistical artifact or they could be overlooking systematic effects. Now, what's interesting, some of those systematic effects may have physical uh, significance. In other words, there may be an overlooked physical phenomena that might explain, for example, why we're getting more galaxies in the very distant universe rotating opposite of a Milky Way galaxy than is the case of galaxies that are nearby our Milky Way galaxy. And, uh, that to me would not be surprising because in the early universe, in the case of an expanding universe, and that's what's interesting, this paper is trying to dispute the Big Bang theory uh, that the universe is explained by continual expansion and therefore galaxies expanding away from one another. But if the Big Bang theory is true, in the very early universe, you've got galaxies jammed tightly together. And indeed, images of the distant universe affirm that. We do see that the galaxies are jammed way more tightly together than they are in a nearby uh, universe. That's one of the observational evidences that we live in a Big Bang universe. But if that is the case, if you've got a lot of galaxies close together, the rotation influence of a big mass of galaxy is going to influence the rotations of galaxies nearby. And you'd expect in the early universe to get a bias away from 50-50, where 50% rotate in this direction, 50% rotate in the opposite direction. But if you've got galaxies jammed tightly together, uh, there is a significant possibility that the rotations of massive galaxies will influence the rotations of smaller galaxies in their vicinity. Uh, so this needs to be paid attention to, uh, but the paper uh, overlooks some of the reasons why astronomers so strongly disputed Fritz Wicke's hypothesis once they got accurate measurements of redshifts of galaxies. And what they pointed out, for example, is, well, we actually have a way of calibrating uh, the redshift distance relationship. In a Big Bang universe, the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it'll appear to be expanding away from us if indeed the universe is undergoing continual constant expansion from the cosmic uh, creation event. Now, when I was a graduate student, uh, we couldn't really calibrate uh, the redshift measurements even to the nearest galaxy. Today, we can do that thanks to very long baseline interferometry where we can actually measure the orbit of a water maser source going around the center of a large galaxy. So the typical isosceles triangle theorem we use for determining distances, it's basically an assumption-free measurement for determining distances. 
instead of using the baseline of Earth's orbit about the sun, we can use the baseline of a water maser source orbiting about the center of a big galaxy. And with that technique, radio astronomers have been able to affirm the redshift distance relationship out to 470 million light years. And so that's about a half billion light years out. We can demonstrate that indeed uh, the redshifts of galaxies are entirely explained by a universe that's undergoing continual expansion from the cosmic creation event. And with respect to the distance universe, astronomers several decades ago pointed out if Fritz Wicke's tired light hypothesis is correct, uh, even to a small degree, then the images of distant quasars and blazars shouldn't appear as sharp points. They should be blurry, or at least slightly blurry. And when we look at the images of distant quasars and blazars, 100% of them are perfectly sharp. 100% of the images of distant quasars and galaxies show no evidence for blurriness at all, indicating that indeed light doesn't tire either on distances close to our Milky Way galaxy or in extremely uh, distant galaxies. And another reason why astronomers have never been persuaded by the tired light hypothesis is because of the cooling of the universe that we can measure. And I've got a slide here that basically shows measurements we astronomers have made of the past temperature of the radiation left over from the cosmic creation event what we call the cosmic microwave background radiation. And now you can see measurements we've made, but I got a curve overlapping of those little red dots. The red dots are the measurements. The curve you see there is the cooling of the universe. You would expect if the universe indeed has a Big Bang creation event, uh, where the galaxies are continually expanding away from the one another. Uh, and what you note there is that the measurements perfectly fit the Big Bang model without tired light. So there's several reasons why uh, the suggestion made in Shamir's paper we know cannot be correct. Uh, the tired light hypothesis, I wrote about it in my book, A Matter of Days, as well as A Crater in the Cosmos, several years ago, saying there's good reasons why astronomers have not given credence to the tired light hypothesis. And the bottom line is the Big Bang creation model that was first predicted in the Bible thousands of years ago. The Bible actually predicted more than 2,500 years ago four of the fundamental features we now call Big Bang cosmology. And the most significant of those features that was stated in the Bible basically states the universe has a beginning a beginning that includes the beginning of space and time. Space-time theorems prove that, which establishes there must be a causal agent beyond space and time that created our universe of matter, energy, space, and time. Now, as for Shamir's claim that the galaxies discovered by the James Webb Space Telescope in the very early history of the universe look too old to fit the Big Bang creation model, we had a workshop here at Reasons to Believe on the discoveries of the James Webb Space Telescope. I was a participant in that workshop, actually led that workshop, and gave a lecture basically demonstrating that these galaxies that we're discovering do not challenge the Big Bang creation model because what we're now recognizing, the James Webb Space Telescope is actually demonstrating for us that the first stars of form in the early history of the universe, many of them are hundreds possibly even thousands of times the mass of our star, the sun. That being the case, we would expect supermassive black holes to form in galaxies, that the biggest galaxies in the universe indeed will form supermassive black holes, even as massive as a billion times the mass of our star, the sun, before the universe is even 700 million years old. So Shamir's claim that the galaxies in the Earth universe appear to be too old for the Big Bang creation model. Actually, the latest observations from the James Webb Space Telescope are establishing this is exactly what we'd expect in a Big Bang creation model, given that we're now seeing that there are stars in the Earth universe that measure hundreds, if not thousands of times, 
or massive than our star of the sun. We're going to be releasing the lectures from our workshop uh, next month. So uh, in, in October, you'll be able to visit our YouTube website and uh, you'll be able to uh, watch or listen to the lectures there, including the lecture that I gave. So the reason I'm commenting on this paper is basically to assure people they hear about it and it's already gotten a lot of uh, publicity is that this in no way threatens the biblically predicted Big Bang creation model. We really do have an overwhelmingly powerful astrophysical case that indeed an agent beyond space and time created our universe and designed it so we human beings could live in it and thrive during this brief episode in the history of the universe. So uh, this will be posted on YouTube. You can share it with your friends, and uh, you can make comments if you got questions. I actually read uh, your comments and questions, and I will respond to them if uh, deemed appropriate. Uh, so uh, by all means, uh, take advantage of that. And if you're not always a subscriber to a Reasons to Believe YouTube channel, I encourage you to do so. We're literally posting dozens of new video clips there from all different uh, perspectives on the science-based spectrum. And if you're a subscriber, you'll be alerted to the latest videos that we post. Thank you.